Hello, The Line Podcast listeners. April the 5th, 2024, or as I call it, First Contact Day. Great to have you here. Lots to talk about today. We're going to talk about my column uh, published at The Line, plus the broader context of the Foreign Interference Inquiry. We're going to talk about uh, what I had suggested last week. Jen actually wants to follow up on that, whether or not the Liberals have hit the bottom. We're going to do a gut check on where we stand in the fighting in the Middle East. All that and more in the latest episode of The Line Podcast. All right, Jen, uh, you and I, it's funny how this happens. In theory, we like to stagger our columns on alternating weeks so that our valued readers get a you one week and a me the next week and our other valued contributors make out the difference. Also, Last I think that we also appreciate that both of us are best taken in, sh- in small doses. So, you know, we try to parcel out those doses appropriately in order to keep people wanting more. Yeah, exactly. To keep them wanting more, we'll go with that. Um, but I also just think that for a couple of weeks in a row now, you and I have had tandem columns, like one, two punches. So that's, I guess that's the other way of doing it. Um, this week I wrote about the foreign interference inquiry, which is actually interesting because I haven't, I haven't paid that much attention to it, and I'm following it. I'm reading all the coverage on it daily, but like the POEC proceedings, Public Order Emergency Commission, I follow that extensively. Foreign interference, I'm going to read the report when it's done, and I'm going to read the write ups as they come out. I'm not watching the testimony live, but I did make an exception this week for Aaron O'Toole's, te- excuse me, uh, Aaron O'Toole's testimony because I expected that to be interesting, and it was. But I was as or more interested in how the prime minister responded to it. Um, and that's what I, I base my column on. And I, I can recap the thesis if you think that's necessary. But if you just want to jump into it, jump no, in. No, no, I think let's recap the thesis. That, what, something about about Aaron O'Toole's testimony really pissed you off. Or how rather how uh, Justin Trudeau responded to Aaron O'Toole's testimony really yeah. pissed you off. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, uh, Aaron O'Toole testified at some length on... Uh, Wednesday, and mm-hmm. was then cross-examined, and I, I've read the whole transcript, and in my column, I do link to the transcript, so you can go read it yourself, uh, if you're so inclined. I thought his testimony was fair. He has an opinion. Um, his opinion is not universally shared, but I think he articulated it reasonably. And, and just so clear, his, 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 his opinion is that foreign interference, especially, particularly from the People's Republic of China, probably cost the Conservatives, between five and nine seats nine in the last seats. election. That's yep. his a b- belief in his analysis. I mean, I think... He- as well, Jen, is that I think almost the more important thing that he really focused on is that the the safeguards we had in place, the so-called site um, task force, was not effective. He yes, said, that's right. like, what he has learned since through news reports and subsequent CSIS briefings, like, he, Aaron O'Toole's a pretty understated guy. Like, I... Believe me, I recognize his his sense of humor. Like I, he talks the way I talk, and yeah. he had been asked about a briefing he got in 2023 about the 2021 election and what he thought about it, and he's like, "Yeah, it was great. I would have liked it two years earlier." Like, so th- there's a disagreement here, and hey, look, it can be an honest disagreement about how much information the safeguard mechanism should be relaying to campaigns in real time. And I think that there's also a disagreement about Aaron O'Toole's own analysis. So he's claiming that it cost them between five and nine seats. That's not a, a position that is universally held. And in fact, I think we've even held some, done some analysis here at the line from Karen Lal, who did a real breakdown on, this, on the seat by seat. And yeah. This is a disputed number, but that's his number, and I don't think that he's coming at that number, nor do I believe he has an, an incentive to come at that number in any kind of dishonest fashion. And even Aaron O'Toole, and this is really crucial to note, even Aaron O'Toole, has, uh, the former leader of the Conservative Party, has acknowledged those five to nine seats did not cost the Conservatives the election. Chinese well, me... foreign interference did not give the election to the Liberals. And in fact, nobody credible is making that claim. What what Aaron O'Toole has said, and again, I don't say this to endorse what he said, but this is what he said, and, and, and the listeners and the viewers may find it relevant, was that the Conservative Party had what was called a predictive modeling campaign, which mm-hmm. was riding level um, projections of how they were doing and how they would perform on Election Day. And the predictive modeling campaign, Aaron O'Toole asserts, was very accurate, but there were some writings where it was wildly off. 
Mm-hmm. And those are the ridings where, uh, in, in many cases, have large Ch- Chinese Canadian diaspora populations, which Aaron O'Toole asserts, and apparently with, with some evidence having been provided, these are the ridings that were targeted, allegedly, by the, by the Chinese campaigns here. Now, government counsel in cross-examining him had made the point that there are other things at play. Maybe what these writings had in common was not electoral interference. Maybe it was the Chinese community souring on the conservatives. That's right. Like, so there are other possible explanations for that, but um, we'll find out more. And we should note, Jen, we're recording this early enough in the day that for all we know, there's going to be powerful repudiating evidence entered today, and we won't see it because we're sure. jabbing right now. But but I also would also say to Aaron O'Toole's credit here is that, uh, firstly, I don't think we can ever really know for certain. There, there's never going to be a definitive um, piece of evidence that will be able to say that X number of, of voters changed their opinion for Y reason, because the reason why any yep. individual voter will change their mind or go for one party over another is, is multifaceted. Yep. So it's it's not an easy thing to say with any kind of absolute ironclad definitive proof. What I would suggest, though, is that if your predictive modeling is highly accurate in every single writing, except the ones where you're seeing clear evidence of foreign interference, that I think we can infer something reasonable from that. So I, I don't, I don't um, necessarily uh, say think that Aaron Tool is 100% correct, but I also don't dismiss his position, nor do I dismiss the party's evidences as it's being presented in this inquiry. Yeah, and I, I echo everything Jen said there. And in a minute, I'm going to uh, tell our beloved uh, viewers and listeners what the prime minister said and why it pissed me off. But just uh, to build on what Jen just said there, and it's important, I agree with everything she said. Justin Trudeau fairly won a legitimate election, and he is the prime minister. Imagine if the balance of power had been between five and nine seats. And it wasn't, because the because Aaron O'Toole and his party... To be blunt, and I, I say this with, with much love to s- several of the people who were there at the time, they fucked it up. That being said, this is the point I think it's important to make. If the prime minister wants to open the door to suggesting, and I've already I've already read the quote, that Aaron O'Toole is responding emotionally, he's looking for someone to blame. Okay, I, I think that's petty. I think that's dishonest. I think it's, I even say in the column, for the guys who want to campaign against disinformation, you can't bullshit people like that. But hey, Mm -hmm. it's happened before, it'll happen again. Here's the point I want to make. If the Prime Minister wants to open the door to a talk about the uh, emotional motives, for lack of a better term, because that's exactly what it is, of Aaron O'Toole, okay, yeah, let's have that talk. Aaron O'Toole is a human being. I'm a human being. Jen's a human being. Most of you listening, I presume nearly 100% of you are human beings. And finding wanting to blame something or someone for your failures is the most natural thing in the world. Okay. So if we want to accuse Aaron O'Toole of that, sure. Cuts both ways, though. I'm going to quote Ghostbusters here. The door swings both ways. The Prime Minister and the people around him have just as much emotional, ego, pride reasons to not want their victory questioned. And if Aaron O'Toole is going to be accused against everything he has said on the record of trying to blame his loss on this, when he is not, he is emphatically not doing that. And the prime minister wants to suggest that. Okay, if the Prime Minister wants to spout that disinformation and lie to the Canadian people and mislead them in that way, that's his prerogative, but he's opened the door, so let's step through it. And let us review, as I did in my column, the timeline of this. It was over a year ago that the Globe, uh, the Globe and Mail and Global News began to report using CSIS leaks that there may have been foreign interference in the 2021 election. The Prime Minister's first response was to lecture us all on anti-Asian racism. When the opposition parties didn't have that and tried to use committees in the House to advance this, the Liberals filibustered those committees, and they stopped showing up at them to deny them quorum. When the NDP, the the government's uh, confidence supply agreement partner, eventually had enough of that and put down the hammer, after weeks of the Liberals be-clowning themselves with their filibustering tactics, 
agreed to the special rapporteur, David Johnston. The Johnston report went up like the proverbial lead balloon. Johnston, under conservative fire, some of which probably was unfair, resigned. Only then do we get a foreign inquiry. And can I also point out that what we've got so far from the foreign inquiry kind of blows a lot of what Johnston did yes, produce you can. radically out of the water? I don't, it's, uh, okay, I'm going to quibble with the phrasing here. Okay. I don't think it has blown it out of the water in the sense that it has gone 180 degrees. But there are things we are learning. We're only like three or four days into the evidentiary testimony. Would have been nice if the special reporter had mentioned some of this stuff. I mean, give, I think one of the obvious examples, and correct me if I'm, in, if I'm wrong here, was didn't David Johnston more or less single-handedly try to exonerate um, Liberal MP Han Dong, who was accused in various um, media reports through that was obtained through CSIS leaks? of advocating for the Chinese to effectively keep the two Michaels in captivity for political reasons. I, I think a, uh, an allegation that Mr. Dong himself has had, had previously rather vehemently denied. Yeah. And I think Johnston, I think more or less had, had, had exonerated him on this point. But then when I believe Han Dong testified a testimony, he got, we got a whole lot of, well, I don't remember. So I'm very <laughs> mindful of the legal implications of our comments sure. right now. So what Absolutely. I will simply say is this. With hindsight, it would appear that David Johnston was a more passionate advocate of Han Dong than Han Dong. Han Dong himself has now accepted a more nuanced position than I believe the special rapporteur did. And Global News, God bless them, hat tip to our colleagues there. They've put together a timeline of the Prime Minister's statements on Han Dong. And they've changed. Oh, okay. They have changed. It went it went from full, okay, he's stepping out of caucus not to be a distraction. It's a smear campaign against him. We stand behind him. It's outrageous. Senior liberal types were fundraising for his legal fees because he's suing Global News or Sam Cooper or both because uh, Coop has left Global News. I don't know exactly how that lawsuit's proceeding, but there's there's litigation involved there, which is why we're speaking so carefully right now, by the way. Um, and the, there was this, hey, like, Han Dong has been wronged. Han Dong has, through his lawyer, I believe, amended some of his previous testimony before the commission. He has now moved from, and I quote this in my column, a strong, full-throated denial of the reports. That That has now evolved to, I don't think I would have said that, but I don't specifically recall. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, and, and as well, I mean, other things we've learned, like you've mentioned Han Dong, we have now learned more specifics about the allegations of Han Dong. We have now learned about Chinese money transferring operations in this country as assessed by CSIS. We have now learned that in 2019, a CSIS report that came to a strong conclusion about foreign interference activities in Canada was revised, watered down afterward. So I don't want to paint a conspiracy, uh, conspiratorial picture here. CSIS and other intelligence officials will be testifying today, I think, and, and others in the days to come. And the prime minister himself will testify. I have a very open mind to what they have to say. I am not urging anyone to jump to any conclusion except this one. We know stuff that we would not have known if this process had stopped with David Johnston. We know stuff that we never would have found out if the liberal filibuster had been successful at the committee stage. We know stuff we never would have found out about if the prime minister had been able to anti-Asian uh, racism us into silence over a year ago. And if the prime minister wants to cast aspersions on Aaron O'Toole's motives, my question is simply this. What do we make of the man who won an election where there has been alleged interference who has done everything in his power to block investigations into the circumstances of that election here. I do not question the integrity of the election. The outcome, I do yeah. believe Canadians ought to have concerns about the prime minister's motives in much the, say the, in much the same way the prime minister seems to have concerns about Mr. O'Toole's. And I, okay, so when I read your column last night, I did a quick edit on it, very light edit on it. I came away. That's why we with, pay you the big bucks. That's why we pay me the big bucks. Also, um, I, all, everyone, behold my basset hound mug. Oh, so cute. So my only criticism of your column, and it wasn't really a criticism, but it was an observation. 
And that was, I think, because you and I are both very much trained in mainstream media standards of what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate to say. And what I would say, uh, we're trained to understand libel law. We're trained to understand when a comment or when an idea would meet the the, the, the standards of publication. Although we don't bat a thousand. <laughs> Although, no, absolutely, we don't bet a thousand, and, and no human will or, or, or does on, on a lot of this stuff. And, yeah. you know, we struggle with a lot of the stuff as like, as like anybody else. But I came away from your column with the sense that you were trying to be extremely careful and extremely generous to the prime minister and his motives. If you are going to say that the reason why the liberals have been so... Um, demonstrably unwilling to seriously address claims of foreign interference is fundamentally rooted in emotion, ego, right? Essentially, Prime Minister Trudeau just can't handle having uh, his legitimacy questioned. And this is a little bit of a, a pugilist's response, screw you back kind of, de kind of deal. That's one interpretation. But bluntly, I think that it is a naive interpretation. And I think that it's, I say that not because I think you're naive. I think that it comes across as naive because you're trying to be careful. Um, but I don't think even the prime minister's ego can account for the behavior that you have just correctly listed in your previous comments. When we're talking about the anti-Asian racism, whether what we're talking about the liberals attacking journalism, whether or not we're talking about the committee chicanery, or whether or not we're talking about the, the Johnston, the fact that who, the fact that Johnston himself was chosen and the inadequacy of the report that he produced before he resigned, all of these things cannot be accounted for by one man's ego. I think that a more reasonable interpretation of that isn't that necessarily the Liberal Party is in is is being controlled like Mary pu pu puppeteers by China. I don't think that is a reasonable interpretation of the evidence at hand. But what I do think is a reasonable interpretation is that there are a lot of people, mostly in the Liberal Party, but not exclusively in the Liberal Party, and the people they connect with, hang around with, socialize with, who are very financially dependent upon China. <laughs> and as a result, this is just um, an, and I mean, I think this is even it, it, it was evidence was was almost was almost openly on display when the Michaels were in captivity. A lot of, for example, old uh, liberal hands and and uh, senior apparatchiks signed and former ambassadors to China and all the rest signed an open letter, basically telling the liberal government to let Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou go in order to get the Michaels back. They just said like capitulate. They, they, they put their names on it for Christ's sake. So like, this is not a conspiracy. This is, this is not even really an, an open secret. It's not even a secret that a lot of people who are in our culture's political and cultural elite have ties to China, financial ties, social ties, political ties. It's, it's a really messy kind of set of connections. China is, again, it's not a secret that China has operated in a lot of Western countries over the last generations to build these ties. Um, and to some extent, that's fine. That's a completely legitimate thing for China to do up until the moment when it starts to interfere in inappropriate ways with, with our elections. It's not inappropriate, for example, for major business leaders to form, to want to create financial ties to China. It's not, it's not inappropriate for our ag sector to be dependent on China. It's not inappropriate for our mining sector, for our oil and gas sector to be dependent on China. It's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing up until the moment when China starts to abuse those economic and social ties in inappropriate ways. And I think that the more obvious motive for all of the actions that you have correctly labeled here is that this is just a Pandora's box that these people don't want to open. Because if you start opening this Pandora's box, you have to start confronting the depth of some of these connections. And that gets real messy real quick, especially when you're a relatively small country like Canada that lacks the financial and geopolitical standing to pick a fight with China. I don't think I disagree with anything you just said. Uh, I'm going to continue being cautious for a further 10 seconds and simply note, we do not wish to imply anything about the individual motives of anyone who may have signed that letter. I'm sure you're all wonderful people. Um, what I will say and I think it's a statement I can make on a completely 
factual basis. There has been an enormous amount of money spent either directly by China or via Chinese companies or people with ties to China in this country over the last generation. And I think having stated that f fact, we can then note that money in a traditional sense, based on historical observations, has often accrued influence. Yes. And one of the easiest things we could have done in this country, and one of the things that the, uh, the former public safety minister, Marco Mendocino, had said might happen would be a foreign agent registry in this country. Which, which would, we should have. Which our allies have, and which the government has even said it would be prepared to have, but we haven't heard from it lately, have we? No. We haven't heard a word it's, about it's, it. That is a very, very obvious transparency measure that we should have. Period. And and I think without again, without wishing to impugn any honorable individual, we have to start asking why we don't have it. Well, and then the other thing I would also point out here is that this isn't just the liberal government. We know that Oh, that the money's been spread around. The real money's nice. been spread around really well, and I that not only that, but I mean up until a few years ago, there was a prevailing belief about China, and that was oh, as – democratization and, was, and ties and yeah. building prosperity, yeah, and they will become yeah, more as, like as, us the more yes, they buy as, our canola. That's right. As the as uh, uh, China liberalizes democracy – sorry, liberalizes economically, this was going to lead to an inevitable political liberalization as well. And Oops. a lot of – well, well the good thing is it wasn't poorly intentioned, and I would say the Harper government – fell into this as well. Previous oh, yeah. liberal governments fell into this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people went into trying to build ties with China with the best intentions. It wasn't a corrupt thing, you know, for, to, to want to um, build economic ties with China 10 years ago. That was a very reasonable and in fact, a very mainstream point of view. Um, yeah. And I think it's only been in the last five, six years, really, um, with a lot of the more authoritarian shifts coming out of China, especially under Xi Jinping, that there's been a collective oh shit moment um, and a lot of the old well-intentioned but naive assumptions about about those connections have had to be characteristic sort of systematically re-examined and maybe yeah. re-evaluated and you, you know, know it just happens that that shift has happened under the liberals watch that doesn't mean that they're yeah. except, that doesn't yeah, yeah. mean that they're that they're that they're the baddies they're not this is a deeper issue and I also would want to restate this again, because I think this needs to be very emphatically stated by people who are you know, relatively mainstream columnists. We don't think that China rigged the last election. We think that the prime minister, Justin Trudeau, is the legitimate prime minister. That should just be our headline. Yeah. And also, just so that we're clear, we don't think that China is actually pulling the strings in Canadian yeah. politics. Politics is just radically more complicated than that, particularly in a parliament parliamentary system that we have. No me... one actor can just pull the strings. That's not how power works here. But I do think it's very obvious now that, that they are trial running ways in which to exert influence and power in ways that are inappropriate in a democracy. That is really clear now. And I do think that it's very clear as well that some of the generational economic and cultural ties that were built on on mutuality and respect and trust have to be reconsidered and reevaluated in that light. There is no way China, and I'm using that term very broadly, including yes, Chinese business because interests. China is also complicated. Let's also be yeah. clear. There's, but there's no way that China, again, using that broadly, could spend the amount of money in this country that they have had over the, that, that they have over the last generation without making a few friends who would be have a motivated self interest in making sure that that level of spending continues. Sure. And let let me give you, uh, I won't get into specifics here, but let me give you an example right out of our own industry. And this is something I've mentioned before. This is not something I haven't mentioned before. You and I, Jen, have both had opportunities in our career to leave journalism and move into a more generic communications and government relations role. We have been, mm -hmm. uh, both in our times, we've been approached by companies that would want to no, have our services. No, you've been approached. No one is crazy enough to think that I would be a good fit for that. <laughs> I have been approached by <laughs> extremely reasonable, intelligent companies. And I don't know, never say never. Maybe that maybe that's where my career will lead me eventually. If you don't want that to happen, like, subscribe, and donate to the <laughs> yeah, line today. Exactly. Um, but I... I, I a few years ago, I was considering it and I was considering it for kind of personal lifestyle reasons. 
And I had some conversations with very smart people who have either always been in the comm sector or who had been journalists who then moved into the comms. And one of the things I was talking about was I was just trying to, I didn't, I don't understand the sector. Like I, I know it a bit better now, but at the time I didn't understand it. And I was like, what am I worth? Like, I know what post media is willing to pay me, but what would this company pay me? Or what would that company be willing to pay me? And one of the things that in all these beers and lunches and phone calls I had with people that just really came through to me was that, first of all, I probably could have tripled my income mm -hmm. if I had left journalism and gone into a fairly, I was like, the positions I was being offered were relatively good because I was a senior post media at the time, but I probably could have tripled my income while working less. Mm -hmm. And if I was willing to do it with either uh, with Chinese organizations or Canadian organizations that have a lot of Chinese clients, I could have increased my income 15 times. And this was something that was understood. Yeah. And it was, you have to kind of decide for yourself how you want to do this. But your hourly rate working for doing client relations work for Ford or CN Rail or Some Labatt's or yeah, where yeah. the hell owns Labatt's would be X. And if you want to do it with happy, friendly Sinocorp B, your hourly rate will be 10X. So a lot of people took the money. No. I, 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 the other, the, I will, I will share a little anecdote that I can tell you as well is that I, I, a couple of years ago was invited to be a panelist, sort of a political panelist. I'm, I'm, a, I'm often invited to do political panels, to various different organizations and whatnot. And most of the time I say yes, because of, generally speaking, unless there's a reason well, not to do it, they, yeah, totally do it. And there's no, uh, I said, there's no conflict in terms of my journalism there. I'm literally going to offer political analysis to Here's a panel. what I it's, think. Yeah. It's, this is what I think about things. And people want me there because they generally want to hear what I actually have to say. And I got to do a panel at a, at a kind of an ag, it was an ag thing, it was agriculture. Um, so it was a political panel with other well-known local political panelists. And we were talking politics and local politics and federal politics. And this was when the, the Michael stuff was happening. And I said to this ag conference, like, you guys need to be cautious or, or start to seriously reconsider some of your some of your financial connections with China, because at that point, remember that that uh, China was trying to punish Canada by blocking exports. I think it was either to pork or canola or something like that as a as an economic lever to try and put pressure to get them to release Meng Wanzhou. Um, so they were openly doing this. This wasn't a secret. This is, this is, this is what they were, what they were doing. They were using their, their, the, the economic levers that they had consciously cultivated in order to um, try and push a geopolitical outcome, a specific geopolitical outcome. And I just said, look, the, China's telling you in no uncertain terms what it's willing, the, the, the games it's willing to play here. You as business people have to accept some, I mean, I probably said this in a less, um, diplomatic way than this but you as business people have to accept that as you part of your risk never. calculations like I, I i that's if i were in your position and i were putting millions of dollars on on perishable crops and selling them to china in in, in from canada i'd have some concerns that is a high risk proposition for you yeah um and i think you have to ask yourself the degree to which that's that's something that you're ethically and personally comfortable with because you will be, you you are at this point. You can't be naive about the degree to which you will be used as an economic tool in geopolitical realities. And the room went dead, and I was never invited back to another ag sector conference. I mean, you know what it reminds is... me of, Jen? It the old joke, and I'm sure you've heard it. If you owe the bank a hundred dollars, that's your problem. If you owe the bank a hundred billion dollars, that's the bank's problem. Yeah, and. Right? When there's that much money moving around here, the power relationship can very suddenly reverse itself. Well, and it also can be very, very hard, if not impossible, to make hard ethical decisions when it's that much money, when it's when it's everything, right? Um, so, like this I said, this podcast sponsored by like, China. Think, yeah, like I said, <laughs> just, I think it's really it, easy. I think China. It's, it's, I think it's really easy for someone here in the West, as I'm in Calgary, to say, "Well, you, you." Laurentian consensus elites, you're, you're, you're two in the tank for China. But bluntly, I don't think it's just the Laurentian consensus elites that are in the tank for China. Oh, I think look they, at the money flowing into natural resources projects anywhere west of the Ontario right? border. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of money slopping where, where around here. Where was the here, conference? And, that's one you're talking about. No, where it, was was it? it was in Calgary. It was in Calgary. 
So, I, you know, we at you the line are, I... are, are actually independent. You can tell this because we can have this conversation openly. I think there are, I mean, also during the foreign interference, it's come up that there have, China's been working with various media outlets to try and, 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 and influence coverage. I think that's mostly in the Chinese language media outlets. Mm-hmm. I have a really hard time imagining that China is being effective at um, buying off the CBC, for example, or the Global Mail, or the Trust. I don't think that's the case. I think that they've mostly put their efforts into things like, like, um, uh, as I said, have I told you my gift stuff card story? St- stuff that's stuff that's directed toward the diaspora here. Have I told you my gift card story? No. So this is years ago. I was working for Global News at the time uh, as a radio host in Toronto, and uh, we had a. When you're in that line of work, you're constantly getting pitches, just people emailing, hi, Matt, I represent so-and-so, and and we would love to talk about this. And 99% of those go right in, in, like, if I open them at all, they just get deleted. But it actually came one from a very large company that had a public policy complaint about upcoming uh, legislation, and I agreed with it. I thought the company was right. I thought the legislation was stupid. And uh, the the PR guy was offering up some corporate executive to come on the show and uh, talk with me about their concerns about the legislation. And I, I said to my producer, you know what? Normally I wouldn't do this stuff because I hate these pitches, but I actually agree with this. Let's get this guy on the show. And my producer set it up. We had an interview. Everything went great. The next week, I got mail from that talent guy that included a very large gift card from the company's store. I mean, okay, so if the, com- if the I, company's naive yeah, and doesn't I understand... I took that thing to my boss and handed it to him and forwarded him every bit of correspondence I had had in relation to this matter, and I yeah. looped in my producer yeah. to confirm every bit of it because retroactively, I had sold airtime, which right. is something I would never do. Yeah. And eventually, like my boss took it, he listened to me. About a week or two later, he came back to my desk. He said, "He said we've talked, we, we took it to legal. We've talked to everybody. Enjoy your gift card. Like you did nothing wrong. Go spend the money." And so I spent the money and I enjoyed it. But I never worked with that talent booker again, and I never spoke to anyone from that company again. So my 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 imagine that you... at the scale of a nation state, and well, it's not a gift yeah. card; it's a lucrative contract. It's every lucrative contract. I mean, it, you, thank you so much for your for inviting me to your conference. We need a, a services done, and we're prepared to pay you a thousand times the rate of normal. Yeah. Send us an invoice for an hour of work. We will pay you 1,000 times your normal rate. There's a lot of ways that gratitude has been expressed in this country. Much of it, I think almost all of it legal. Yeah, and, and not necessarily inappropriate. I mean, the story you're telling here, my guess is that probably the guy who had you on the, the, the radio show was just really appreciative of your time and just wanted, thought that is thought of that gift card as being a, a fairly benign gesture of thanks without and realizing. Didn't think what it does. Well, d- but probably didn't realize, was probably too naive about journalistic ethics to understand mm-hmm. that that's not something that we can generally just accept. We I will mean, take I, advertiser I, money and it will be extremely clear it's advertiser money. It cannot yeah, be pay for play. It, it can't be pay for play. And, yeah. uh, you know, as I said, I think in that case, that probably was just a, a somebody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a gesture evil, of kindness. I don't think it was poorly intentioned. But I remember but when I imagine it at, is deliberate and it's a nation state. Well, but I also remember even when I was at the, the, the Toronto Star, for example, and I was working in the entertainment section, it was really common for people to throw you gift cards. Really, oh, yeah. really common. Or tickets, to, and... or tickets or gift bags yeah. or goodies. And to some extent, this wasn't even targeted at me as a journalist. It was just they, they, they throw this, they were throwing this shit around. Right? They need to fill rooms. They need to fill especially, rooms. Especially with tickets. Yeah. They want um, to fill rooms with people who have large social media profiles. But for it anybody makes perfect who... sense from their perspective and it compromises. Us. And it compromised Anyway, that only happened the up. one time, and I did no, enjoy the gift but, card. But, but also at the same time, like we, we were told very explicitly, you can't take the gift card. They, they got there was an ironclad rule, and different organizations have different ethics around some of that stuff. And I'm not I'm not impugning yours at all, but I would say that you know, when I was at the start, it was like, nope, turn that shit in right away. You cannot take the gift card. You cannot spend the gift card. You cannot engage in that because it it creates the illusion or the perception, and that sometimes even psychologically, the reality of a pay for play system. And that's not mm. what you can engage in as a journalist. So if you are running a media company, don't send people gift cards, please don't. <laughs> like it just makes our or lives harder. Or if you're dealing with a media company, yeah, exactly. don't send it, them gift cards. It, it actually makes our lives harder 
uh, than if you just don't send the gift card. <laughs> and there um, are totally easy ways to give us money. Sponsor yeah, something. Yes, sponsor like, us. Take like, don't as don't long send as it's us gift cards. Yeah, as long as it's open and disclosed and it's all uh, up front, it's it's fine. You can pay for advertising. You can sponsor us, and we are in fact mm -hmm. open to taking sponsors, um, just in case you're interested. But no, you can't do the even if it's done in an innocent gesture of thanks. You can't. Don't send gifts. Just don't. That this the kind of soft influence China has in this country is massive. Okay. And but what, but what you can have do, to start dealing with that. What you can do is like and subscribe to Line. Like um, that's, and subscribe. That's completely above board. Um, this that podcast note, brought to you by China. <laughs> Thank you. Ka ching. <laughs> um, look, uh, Matt, last week in our podcast, you had made note of the idea that you thought that the liberals had kind of finally reached their bottom, seemed to be finding their footing, yep. seemed to be actually fighting back. And my goodness, was that prescient? Because last week, we had the Liberals announced a signature policy, which was the uh, they want to create a national school lunch program. Essentially, I think even last week they came out with some so like six billion dollar fund on housing, or that maybe in the week before. I'll double check. They came with a uh, six billion was this week. Last week it was renter bill of rights. Yeah, last week was renter bill of weeks. This week it was a six billion dollar fund for housing, and essentially mm -hmm. announcing in their budget that they're shamelessly copying and copying and pasting the conservative uh, housing platform, which yep. fair enough. Um, we had Trudeau give an absolutely hilarious little presser where he explains that our capacity for immigration had grown past our ability to absorb it. And then we have the prime minister on the CBC on the Galloway show talking about what a disaster our healthcare system's in. Matt, and if he finds the guy who did it. <laughs> Matt, it seems to me like the liberals struggling in the polls have finally figured out how to win and that's to run against themselves yeah they've met record. the enemy and it is them um okay so let me let me say a couple things um one it's when i said last week and it was kind of just I, I threw the idea at you it wasn't like this well formulated thing um didn't have one of those brain what you might call it so it was just like kind of this notion i had but one of the things i want to be clear on i don't know if they've hit their polling bottom like, for all I know, nothing they're trying right now is going to work, and they're going to continue declining. For all I know, they're about to begin a historic rebound, and they're going to win a massive majority. Who knows? Anything can happen. But when I talk about finding their bottom, I don't necessarily mean anything that's going to be directly reflected in the polls. I mean, more broadly, um, that they're starting to get out of a stupor that they've been in for a while, where they've been adrift and confused. Well, I think and about a year starting... and a half now, won't they? Pardon me? I think about the last year and a half, they've been in a bit of a stupor. Well, I mean, I called it, and I it's in writing, uh, it's in the line. I called it in June of 2022, but I think it got worse over the last eight months, call it. And maybe, I've had the sense of the last week, maybe they're shaking it off a bit. But the interesting thing is, I've actually seen some signs this week that they haven't. And one of the, the ideas that's occurred to me, and I'm just going to bounce this off you here. What if... What we're looking at now is not a bottom finding, and it's not an overall rebound. What if it is residual muscle memory of how to roll out a budget? Like, what if this is something they're still good at? Budget's coming up. They're doing all these announcements are pegged to the budget. This is all pre-budget positioning. What if they do all this stuff, release a budget, get a, a one or two week bounce, or even just some positive attention? And then three weeks from now, they're just right back to adrift where they were. Maybe roll. And then, again, I'm not making a bet on this. We'll see. But maybe rolling out a budget is the last thing they still know how to do. And maybe that's why they look good right now. They're doing the thing they know how to do. Maybe, except that doesn't explain to me the the immigration conversation and the healthcare conversation. Also, once again, the prime minister is going to be in Calgary today. Why does he keep on coming to Calgary? I don't understand what's happening. But anyway. Um, I think that they are probably just starting to correctly identify what the problems really are and how deep the problems really are. And I think they're also starting to, uh, correctly target lock on, uh, why people are angry and they're starting to realize it's not misinformation. You know, yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. So not that I begrudge this, um, but there is one point I had wanted to make in the past topic that I just didn't get a chance to. The conversation moved on. That's fine. But this is great. 
I organically have a chance to make the point I actually wanted to make before. You had laid out a theory in the last conversation um, that my, like I had suggested that Trudeau, well, I'm not even suggesting it, but maybe the possibility is Trudeau has had a hard time accepting foreign interference because of his emotional state. And you had actually made this counter proposal. It's about the scale and scope of, of China's involvement in Canada. Could be either. There's a third option and it relates to this. They're bad at feedback. They're, they're just not good at feedback. And even when it's coming from a friendly or a neutral source, if you tell them they're fucking up, they will not believe you and they will dig in and they will fight and they'll do everything in their power. And we can look at foreign electoral interference. So let's just pause it before I, I'm not going to send the conversation back, but I'll bring it right back to what we're talking about here on the political front. Two possibilities we floated in the last segment about why the Liberals were slow to respond to China electoral interference. One, Prime Minister's emotional investment in his victory. Two, the scale of Chinese investment in this country having compromised or at least influenced individuals. Option three, the more they were warned about it, the more they petulantly were like, yeah, fuck you. No, that's not it. We are the adults in the room. Hmm. That's something we've seen with these guys a lot and they can overcome it, but they're slow Hmm. and they do a lot of additional political damage to themselves and the time it takes for them to come around to, you know, and actually maybe these guys are right. How long did poor (laughs) sainted Mike Moffat spend going, guys, you have a housing problem and nothing happened. How long, I mean, think back to the start of COVID and that unfolded because of the nature of the event over uh, weeks and months, not years, but we had a fucking viral tidal wave sweeping across the earth in a pretty predictable geographic path. And the federal Canadian response was "Ah, the risk is low. Oops. No, it's here. And, um, you know, with, with we so many close things borders because closing borders is racist is racist. Lessons of SARS. We're going to be fine. Just These so that we're clear, guys... all of the countries that did, did close borders did better. Just so that we're clear on that. Anyway, moving on, moving on. Don't need to really so get COVID. The reason I bring this up is on, in terms of the politics of what they're doing here, whether it's immigration, whether it's uh, the prime minister on the current to talk health care, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, g- general cost of living issues, because like, for instance, the, uh, the mini pharma care announcement that's targeted at paying for medicines that, uh, well, for, of contraceptives, obviously for women and diabetic medications, which can be financially burdensome. The food, the school food program, that's targeted at helping people. So they are pivoting to the issues that have been killing them. And I just wonder if it's because they have, in just the same way that eventually we got a foreign interference inquiry. You know, I was, I was talking with a friend last night about this. You know what Churchill used to say about the Americans, right? They will always do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And well, there's, almost a, there's almost a weird parallel with the Doug Ford stuff. Cause I mean, you make this point about Doug Ford all the time. This is a guy who will always make the, who will come out with a strong stance right up until the moment he gets any opposition on it. And then he instantly flip flops. Right. And then he takes the 180 degree. Yeah. 180 degree on, on, it. On, on it. Right. No, um, I don't, I don't think the liberals have 180. No, they don't 180 fully. and they take a lot longer, but I don't know if that's better or worse. <laughs> I don't know either. I mean, elect, I mean, look, Doug Ford was reelected with a majority. We'll see how the prime minister does in a this year is, or this two. Is, this is an accomplishment that the current federal liberals have never managed a second majority. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, no, honestly, I'm just like, you know what? They have had some fight. They've had some spark. They've had some spring in their step. They've had some good messaging. I think to your point, they have target locked the appropriate issues, even if it requires them to now be carpet bombing their own previously held positions. Um and out, and in a lot of ways, out maneuvering Pierre Polyev to the right, mm-hmm. right? That's going to be an interesting one. I mean, I want to talk about the, the school lunch program a little bit because I think this is really smart retail politics because mm-hmm. bluntly, it gets to cost of living issues. It gets to feeding kids. It's it's almost literally motherhood and apple pie. It's motherhood and apple pie. This is, this is the saying, right? It's a motherhood and apple pie issue. It's ameliorates poverty. Um, everybody feels good about doing it. Lots of nations have very effective uh, school lunch programs. Um, it is actually a problem worth addressing. And bluntly, 
Everybody hates making their kids lunches. Like it's just the most annoying <laughs> goddamn. Nobody likes doing this. I hate doing this. You hate yeah. doing this. We see that chick on I TikTok. I don't do this. My wife will tell you at length that she does it. Yeah, we all see the chick on TikTok who does those really perfect little bento boxes for her children and husband, and we hate that chick, even though we keep and can't stop watching her. No, that is not my child's lunch. My child's lunch is the one thing he'll eat, which is fried rice, chicken, it's, and a gorilla it's an, bar. Uh, it's an actual joke in my marriage, Jen. Somewhat passive aggressive sometimes, sometimes totally legitimately humorous. That when either my wife and I don't want to do something, we just go, oh, I'm sorry, I have to make the kids' lunches. <sighs> Say, so, hey, do you want to watch the rest of the Leafs game? Oh no, I got to make kids lunches. Hey, Matt, do you want to come watch this new Netflix show? Sorry, babe, got to wa- I got to make kids lunches. Like, it's how we get out of things we don't want to do because it's just a task that is never, it's never also, complete. The children never eat it. Like, like it's getting them to eat food is impossible. Like, this yep. all I ask of you is that you stay alive for fuck's sake, child. <laughs> they won't do it. Sorry, I'm stuffed up. Anyway, so. The struggle it's, is real. And, I, you know, if, if the there could be a billion real. dollar federal task force to get my son to eat properly, I would I'd be a single issue voter on that. It, it addresses it addresses school nutrition. It's really, really smart retail politics. And also it's a great wedge issue because anybody who points out the extremely obvious opposition to this is like, why you're don't an you asshole just, who wants children to starve. Yeah. Why don't you just want to feed? What do you want to shoot a puppy while you're at it? Like, you know what I mean? Why don't you just strangle one up while you at it? You monster. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's good wedge politics. However, of course, yes, there are very obvious objections to it. Of course, provincial jurisdiction being one, that's a pretty weak objection. The federal government does lots of stuff in the area of provincial jurisdiction. And essentially, from a confederation point of view, this is great bare knuckle politics because they can say, look, we're going to give you $600,000 to implement a school lunch program, Manitoba. And then if Manitoba doesn't take the money, they look like they're the assholes, not the federal government. So it's 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 a smart sort of political federal wedge. Yeah. It's a Fuck smart you, Manitoba, hypothetically. Yeah, it's it's a it's a smart ideological wedge. The obvious objection to it, as well as like the, the infrastructure, just would have to be built from scratch because most schools don't have, well, especially elementary schools, don't really have um, cafeterias. So how some do you actually? Do. Some of them do. But I know none of mine do. So you're talking about you need some kind of centralized facility to do mass lunches, and then you need this distribution. This should not be beyond the possibility of a G7 nation, but it's not as simple. It's not as it's not as simple. It's not as simple as just throw money at the problem and someone will make a sandwich. You, you, you know need what? to. I I sl- I kind of disagree with you here, but in okay. in this way, mostly agree with you. Uh, Kathleen Wynn, former Premier of Ontario, former MPP from my riding, had a a tweet this week and, and Kathleen, if you hear this, I'm not picking on you. You know, I love you. She was like, she's sorry. I don't remember not the... Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> the tw- I don't remember the exact wording of the tweet, but it's kind of like, who cares about the jurisdiction? Like, like let's feed the hungry kids. I think all of us agree with that as a moral imperative. Sure. The problem is that I think it is not a good idea to say, let's not care about jurisdiction. Let's just get it done in a country with a proven track record of, of getting... epically fucking up anything that crosses jurisdiction. Yeah. Like, <laughs> From like pipelines I, I, to healthcare. <laughs> so I, I, I wrote for TVO.org where I'm a columnist this week about a fantastic story. It is just darkly hilarious. It's from Cottage Life magazine. As I joked with you before we started recording, the complete, the, the go-to source for all accessible middle-class writing. Um, It's a guy in the Muskokas who built himself a bespoke full-time residence. And the reason I bring this up is because he wanted his home to be totally off uh, carbon neutral. So instead of using fossil fuel-based heating, propane, oil, natural gas, he went with heat pumps. Heat pumps, of course, are the technology the federal government wants us to be moving to. And that the government of Ontario is not encouraging people to use, but has enabled them to use. Provincial legislation and regulations recognize heat pumps as a valid uh, home heating system for, for building code purposes. His local municipality rejected it. So here is an example. Like, this is why anytime anyone says, like, let's just get it done. Don't worry about the jurisdiction. We've got one order of government that is encouraging something. Another order of government that is accepting something and a third order of government that isn't accepting it. And it's something that in the abstract 
all three orders of government would agree was good. So is it good retail politics? Yes. Is it a good idea? Yeah, I'm sold on the evidence. Is it possible? Sure. Pro- but we're yeah. going to fuck this up three ways from Sunday. Well, and this is where we this get into Canada. implementation. We don't do no, multi-jurisdictional stuff here. We don't do big things very well. <laughs> you could just add a sentence there. <laughs> like and subscribe. No, we don't do big things well <laughs> here in this place we live. Um, no, I mean, I, I had a similar moment when during the last election when the I think the liberals tried to secure their fairly narrow minority um, with the $10 a day daycare plan. And my position on this was always, I can be sold on a $10 a day daycare plan. I can be sold on the importance of female participation. I can be sold on the importance of affordable daycare. I can be sold on this from a moral, from an economic and from a poverty yeah. point of view. We can note There's, and celebrate the provincial federal agreements. Abs- absolutely. But if but, you think that these people are actually going to implement a real $10 a day daycare program nationally, in order and you think that that's and you're voting on that you are being profoundly naive that's not it how will be this ready is ready by the time your grandkids need it well or if it's not it's not going to be quite what was promised it wasn't going to it's not going to come out in it's not we're not going to replicate the um quebec model there's going to we're going to replicate the worst aspects of the quebec model which is that it's ten dollars a day care day daycare for the people the who are and connected. For the affluent and well connected, able to to get into it, it's going to be yeah. ten dollar a day daycare f- from nine to five. It's not going to reflect like the reality of shift work. It's you know it's 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 going to be problem on problem on problem. So if you think that you are going to get Quebec's daycare program in British Columbia within two years because you vote liberal, oh my go oh oh my sweet summer child, my sweet sweet summer child, that's that ain't going to happen, and it hasn't. And it's not going to. There are now sort of instead pan-jurisdictional uh, funding frameworks which give subsidized spaces to certain kinds of daycare and yep. have uh, pushed other kinds of daycare, particularly sort of fa- small family-owned daycares, out of business. And it's a giant clusterfuck. As everyone who has seen anything the federal government has rolled out in the last 20 goddamn years could have predicted for you. I've it- commissioned a piece – on this, I, I probably should have told you, sorry, I didn't put that in, in the notes, but I've actually commissioned a piece on this, just a review of where we stand on national child care a couple of years out from it. You know, I said to you a few minutes uh, before we started rolling, because, you know, obviously I, I'll break the fourth wall here just for uh, a second. The listeners and the viewers will know that Jen and I don't completely wing these things. We agree what we're going to talk about. Sure. And this was one of the topics we were going to talk about. And I said, I'm going to lay out the three-step test. Here's my three-step test. And it applies for renter's bill of rights. It, it applies for school food uh, and probably the rental accommodation agreement the liberals are working on now. I haven't read the details of that yet, but here's the three te- step test. The first test, any of these federal announcements has to overcome is are they actually going to try to do it? Because a lot of the time these guys just announce shit. This is something we've talked about a lot. This is a government by announcement. The announcement or, is the point. Or they, they'll throw money at a problem and then they expect someone down the line to actually implement. It's we're, the inputs, right? Yeah. We, we get The politicians get full political value from the announcement. Right. So that's hurdle number one. Is this actually going to be something that receives a lot of attention, serious effort, careful scrutiny, or is it going to be announced and then forgotten like a fart in the wind? So that's hurdle number one. Hurdle number two, assuming it's not a fart in the wind and that there is real political buy-in and the uh, the real exercise of political capital, will the process be successful? Will the provinces and the, and the feds and the territories or whatever, whatever it happens to be, will they be successful in coming up with something to implement? That's hurdle number two. Hurdle number three, does what they implement work? <laughs> and child care is a great example of it cleared hurdle number one. They made the announcement. They followed up with real effort. They cleared hurdle number two. They got the necessary players to participate and designed a system and implemented it. Hurdle number three, does it work? Eh, sometimes. So with we'll, we'll just school, school food, let's just pick on that one. Will the government and, and actually, actually show up? School food Maybe. is also going to be harder than $10 a day daycare, is the other thing I, I would point out. But anyway, yes, go. Will the government show up? I think probably. 
Will they come up with plans to execute with all the necessary stakeholders? Maybe. Will it work as intended? Eh. No, because what's going to happen is that some of the provinces are going to insist on means testing the lunches, which will take away the whole purpose of a universal lunch, because now it's only going to be hot lunches in school for the poor kids, which in itself is its whole problem. If you're going to do a school lunch program, don't means test it. This is not, this is not the place to do means testing. This is the place to actually do universal. Um, but anyway, then a lot of people are going to complain that you're giving rich kids lunches, even though it's a universal lunch program. And then you're going to have the actual physical, unlike the $10 a day daycare, which you could sort by essentially subsidizing existing daycare systems. You're actually going to need to build infrastructure, real actual infrastructure, like for rent or lease or 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 establish or or something. You're going to need to build a workforce to be able to prepare and transport the meals from central locations to where schools don't have kitchens. Yeah. And the federal government's not going to want to do that. And the provincial governments are going to be like, I don't have the internal capacity to organize this shit. So now it's going to be a fight about who to give money to and why and where. Or are you going to try and implement just just expand existing um, charity based uh, school lunch programs? That's great, but they don't exist everywhere in the country, so it's not going to be universal on that front. Yep. Like I said, and where they exist, they'll need to bulk up. All of these things are overcomable obstacles, but they require someone who has got the forced thought to actually think through the problems and execute to the end. In other words, deliverology and implementation. And what is this federal government's track record on that? Mixed. Yeah, look, any again, I know, look, I half of this job is understanding where your critics are going to come at you. So let us repeat as we did before two critical points. Justin Trudeau was legitimately elected the prime minister of Canada. And we're on board with feeding the kids. But we're telling you guys in advance it's going to be harder than you want it to be. And there's one element Jen I'm going to add to what you just laid out there. There's one extra thing I'm going to add to it. How long is it going to be until we find out? Because you're right. Not every, my kid's school actually does have a large kitchen facility and it's been idled since COVID. Mm -hmm. So they could fire that thing back up again. You can do it. But in a lot of places where it won't be possible, we're going to need a series of commercial contracts in place. The ingredients for the food, the preparation of the food, and the transportation and distribution of the food. How long is it going to take until one of these contracts is revealed to be complete fucking graft? It like, and again, feed the kids by all means, but to anyone who's going to be overseeing this program, all I'm, I'm begging you, even from the perspective of don't fuck up feeding the kids. It's like, it's important get it right. Someone is going to orange ambulance this thing. Well, we're going to find out that ABC Healthy Meals Co. is six defeated political candidates who are owed a favor by the incumbent government. No, it's going to be. And even they have no than experience that. making food, packing yeah, food, no, distributing it's, food. So it's no, it's going to be better than that. It's going to be ABC Healthy Food Company, and on the board of directors are going to be uh, five or six liberal or conservative paper candidates and unwinnable writings who were owed a favor because they put their name forward on the board and they got the contract because they were able to um, uh, uh, form an informal or formal relationship with a bureaucrat who's doing a side hustle from health Canada. And it was able to put them on the preferred RFP contractor list. And as a result, they had no effectively no private sector contract or sorry, no private sector competition and got access to this like, what hundred million dollar government um, program that uh, we're not going to have adequate paperwork for to understand how how these people got selected or why or whatever arrive um, meals we'll call it yeah arrive meals and then that or company, meal can yeah and then that company will wind up outsourcing the actual work to a to a private sector company that couldn't get picked as a as a special or or a privileged um, uh, RFP contractor and they'll take like a twenty or thirty percent cut off the top. Yeah, that's that's actually how that's going to play out. And you know the funny thing is, Jen, but we're the kids at, will get fed probably some of them. Oh, rat milk, it'll happen. Oh, I mean, all, all kidding aside, Jen, and I would never joke about this. But and again, I'm not saying this to say we shouldn't do the program. We should do the program. But I'm simply urging everybody who'll be involved. Remember what happened in your city a few months ago. All those sick kids. Mm-hmm. 
I know, Jen, that you and I are going to get criticized for, oh, they don't want the kids, they're, they're, they're heartless we'll, conservatives, don't we'll want the kids to be fed. Heartless, terrible conservatives who want poor children to starve. That's a fair, that's a fair assumption when you're dealing with, with the likes of us. We did work for those media. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, and, and that was our mantra. But they did, guys, they, the, they did desoul us in that process. Well, I mean, the, the soul was sold, obviously, to get the uh, access to the better vending machine up on 11. Um, Don't even get but, us started about the initiation ceremony. There were robes involved, blood. I don't like to remember it myself. It was weird, actually, how much a few of us enjoyed it, but that we can leave that to, to one side. Uh, look, well, there's we a will reason be why some people did better than others in post media. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> what all I'm saying is, if you want to dismiss what Jen and I are saying here because we're evil conservatives, you can do that. What I'm saying to the people who are going to be the most passionate advocates of this proposal, it's on you not to fuck it up. And Jen, you said a minute ago something that I thought, I just want to underline it. You said these are solvable problems. Like the preparation of the food where necessary in central facilities, that's a solvable problem. Cleaning the facilities up to uh, local public health uh, code standards, that's a solvable problem. Contracting it out to um, catering companies or restaurants that might have the, the bandwidth to do this and the, and the facilities and the staff, that's a solvable problem. And, and we can go on and on and down on the list here. Every problem that you and I have mentioned here, including what we're going to find out where it's going to be ABC Healthy Kids Go is just all people who have lost, as you said, writings that they just volunteered to put their names on. Those are solvable problems too, if you put the right rules and oversight in, in place. But the, this is what I'm going to add. This is just going to be a little dose of reality. Every problem we have in this country right now is solvable. Oh, yeah. We just have, we have just real, for some reason. Real straightforward. Failed to solve them. Right. And I think there's this quirk and it's an interesting one. It's panpartisan. I think a lot of people out there, when there's a problem that isn't being solved, they assume it's because the people in power are assholes who like the problem. It never seems to occur to people that most of the problems we have are enduring they roll through multiple governments of different parties. And we should, pro if, if your diagnosis of what the meta problem is, is that bad people are in power, you have probably not diagnosed the problem correctly. Like and subscribe. Brought We're to you by China and ABC Healthy Kids Co. We could very well be the problem. It could be us, Matt. You and I personally? Yeah. Well, it's been suggested. So you have the clock running on your computer. Have we talked enough or do you want to do one more topic? We've definitely talked a lot, but I don't think that we should necessarily not do another topic if it interests us to do so. How long have we been talking? Oh, we're at uh, about an hour and 10 minutes now. Does that include the 10 minutes from before? Yes. Do you want to spend five minutes on an Israel gut check, or do you want to wrap up the podcast and live to fight another let's day? Do, let's do in a five minutes on an Israel gut check, because then we don't have to re-record our, our intro. In the... Oh, that's true. See, Jen's thinking. She's I'm always thinking. Thinking ahead. Thinking ahead. Um, so, Matt, look, look. I mean, uh, you're the, the military guy. You're, you have a, actually a history in... Sorry. A degree in war history. You're more of a history buff than I am by far. So just to a large degree, I think that when we were talking about Israel, especially in the wake of October 7th, when it came to the actual conflict abroad, I've kind of deferred to you on a lot of this stuff. Um, and I think that was a good instinct. Um, mostly, I think you and I have correctly focused on the impact of the war in Israel on domestic politics, yep. because we're a Canadian commentary organization it's not i have we com collectively have the slightest theoretical chance of influencing policy in this country we got fuck all in chance of influencing Correct. knesset or idf senior command policy well not only that but i would also say you know it's not we're not there it's not our war it's not our conflict and bluntly i also kind of think we've focused not just we you and me i mean this country has devoted a lot of emotional time and capital on a conflict over which we have very, very little impact or control. Um, yeah, we have I Canadian would, MPs doing bomb damage assessments. Uh, I, you know, the, the the NDP motion about how we're going to not ship arms to Israel is real nice, except we don't ship arms to Israel. We don't ship arms anywhere, as far as I can Israel tell anymore. Israel ships us arms. Yeah, Israel ships us arms. We you actually know, do ship arms, but not really to Israel. Well, fair enough. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of just, just for those who haven't necessarily been following us through that particular journey, that's where we are. Um, 
I haven't followed the war absurdly closely. I'm definitely mm-hmm. keeping an eye on it, and I'm particularly keeping an eye on some of the weird religious prophetic stuff that's happening mm-hmm. right? because that that that's up my alley. That interests me. Um, but in terms of the day to day military conflict, I I I don't. That's not my focus. I think that's really been more your focus. But it did cross my feed the uh, reports this week of the IDF sort of consciously bombing and shooting at, a, at an aid convoy. Um, I think that shocked the consciences of a lot of people. And I thought it would be a good opportunity for us to go and do a gut check on our positions on Israel. Um, but I think it's probably more appropriate for me to do a gut check with you, because like I said, I, I, I sort of feel like I don't have strong positions on the war on Israel. I, the the bombing of the food aid convoy uh, convoy was uh, inexcusable. It was unacceptable, and it was expected. Why was and it expected? Did, Why do you think it was expected? Because there, because these things happen, and I know that sounds unbelievably trite, especially for the the, the loved ones who lost their families there. And I don't I don't mean that way. I'm not I'm not saying that to excuse what Israel did. This one looks pretty bad, and I don't mean in the evil sense, but like the convoy was explicitly targeted. Like this wasn't like, oops, the missile missed. Like that happens sometimes. Like in in other previous wars, our 99% accurate smart bombs, the 1% that miss sometimes land on an orphanage. Or the other thing I would say is in in a war, you're going to have the odd soldier who is a genuine psychopath and he's going to go and he's going to snap and go on a rampage. And he's going to, yeah, yeah, stuff like that does happen. That, and that's what I meant in the collective sense of, of stuff happens. Um, but in the in the specific case, there seems to have been an actual procedural breakdown in some way, because the uh, World Kitchen program, or I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget what the, the organization is called, but the, the, the charity that was running the food convoy mm-hmm. had coordinated with the IDF. Mm-hmm. They had IDF approval to do what they were doing on the route they were doing it in, and they were deliberately targeted and destroyed anyway, so that the two possible explanations are that Benjamin Netanyahu decided to go out and kill some charitable workers or that something went wrong somewhere in the IDF chain of command between where the information was received and where the strike was ordered. There's been reporting over the last week or two that the IDF has largely automated um, target approval using AI algorithms uh, to expedite and speed up uh the the uh authorization to strike an identified target this is something and i'm not trying to distract from this but this is actually something where we began seeing this if you read up on the military literature we began actually seeing it a lot during the ukraine war something the ukrainians decided to do was to look at the old soviet playbooks that they'd been originally trained on and also to look at the nato playbooks of uh that we were training them on how we approve artillery or airstrikes. There's a whole like chain of command and a process mm-hmm. that has to go through. And the Ukrainians are like, this sucks. We can do better. We can use, I, I've heard it described as almost Uber for artillery, where there are um, targets that are identified and designated. There are artillery or missile or airstrike assets that are logged into the system as available. And a target once approved by the Ukrainians for strike and it has to go through the process, legal and and strategic assessment, is then assigned via the app to the first available asset capable of destroying it. Mm -hmm. And that has really cut down the time it takes for the Ukrainians to put ordnance on a target. And the reason I bring this up, and I'm not trying to distract from Israel, is modern militaries are always trying to speed up the process of destroying an identified target. Okay. And in the Israeli context, where you're dealing with a tiny piece of land where someone can pop up, be spotted and identified, but then be back undercover in minutes, the Israelis have an incentive to hit really fast. And I think what they've done here is they've taken that too far. And I think they are using a target assessment and strike authorization protocol that is too weighted to destroying targets. But that's my assessment. That's my own moral and legal assessment here. The Israelis are operating in a different strategic environment. I saw a really interesting thread this week by a Western military theorist who was saying the way the Israelis are designating and authorizing strikes on targets, even when they work as designed, and this this food convoy did not seem to fucking work as designed, 
even when the Israelis are doing it as designed, they're doing it in ways that would not pass muster under uh, NATO standards of, of uh, review and authorization, hmm. which is interesting. I can't comment on that. This guy knows more about this than I do. Interesting, if true. But also, Israel isn't NATO. Israel's mm. strategic environment is different. Mm. And I, I, I think, like, in terms of the gut check here, I'm, and this is something I'm, I'm saying, the, the hitting the food convoy is unacceptable. And to, to my Israeli and, and Jewish friends who are passionate about the state of Israel here, I'm saying this with love as, as a supporter of Israel, as a supporter of Israel's right to defend itself. Blowing up food convoys doesn't fucking help. It makes your job harder. It makes it harder for me to go out and defend you guys when you're doing things that I think need to be done. So I would prefer it if no more food convoys or medical convoys were destroyed here. But I also think there still remains in the West this failure to recognize that the Israelis aren't playing by our rules because they aren't in our situation. And I'm not asking anyone to therefore adopt the Israeli worldview. You don't have to. But I am saying, if you're baffled by why the Israelis aren't fighting 20 kilometers from their border, the way we fight in Afghanistan, thousands of miles from home, you have missed something in your analysis. So that's kind of where I am. In the big picture sense, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, I think, in the podcast, or maybe I said it in writing. When I supported this war, I think, I think a lot of people supported the war because they were outraged by what happened. They were horrified about the hostages. They were horrified about the rapes and the torture. But that was a gut level reaction. And now they're being confronted by what a war actually looks like. And they're losing their stomach for it because they didn't know what they were signing up for. I knew what I was signing up for. Nothing that has happened yet has fallen outside my expectations of what this is going to look like. Bombing a fucking food convoy, though, is exactly how Israel is going to lose this thing. And they cannot do that again. And I mm. hope they realize it. What what does fall out your side, your, your boundaries of, ex, of acceptable? I would have to become convinced that Israel was killing civilians for the explicit purpose of killing civilians, as opposed to being willing to kill more civilians than we would be in the pursuit of an otherwise hmm. legitimate military target. So you need like, to be convinced, think, that, convinced by the arguments that this is in fact a genocide we're seeing playing out. Not even genocide, that it had actually moved to the explicit targeting of a civilian population, not necessarily for genocidal aims, but perhaps for ethnic cleansing. That we hmm. were going to depopulate an area by bombing it so flat that we will never, uh, and then occupying it, right? Like, that, like there are things Israel could do that I think would cross the line, I think what Israel is doing is being really aggressive in persecuting a war against an identified valid enemy in an urban area. They're being, they're being more brutal about it than we would. Mm -hmm. But I also think, like I, I said this before, and I know it sounds trite and I get it. If there was a terror group in Michigan that was murdering Windsor, the Canadian population would want that group wiped out. This is a classic situation where it is easy to condemn another for doing something that you would probably do in their situation. Think, Israel, think, to, think, to my think... mind, and I know this blows people's minds when I say this, Israel, to my mind, is still acting with restraint. It is not doing everything that it is capable of doing. So so I guess there is a point... At... I actually thought that the fighting would more or less be over by now, that they would have they would have achieved their primary targets by now of killing essentially all of Hamas. You know what? I don't mean to cut you off, Jane, but it's interesting. If you actually look at the level of fighting, the fighting is over to an extent. There have not been major combat operations for some months. The difference is that they are preparing for an additional major combat operation in Rafa. But they're actually like, for, for instance, I don't know if you know this. Israel called up a huge number of reservists early in the war to wage those initial offensives. Those reservists have largely been discharged back home now. Yeah, because, because they, can't, the, the, they can't sustain that level of call up for... True, but they also didn't need them anymore because the tempo of combat operations has diminished that much. Okay. What's happened is that the heavy fighting has basically allowed Israel to uh, surround what it believes is left of Hamas and unfortunately about a million and a half civilians in a very small area. So what is so, left of Hamas at this point? 
Oh, I mean, I don't know. I can tell you that right. the Israeli estimates, which are generally in line with, um, so this is just based on my reading, right? So I'm, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm literally armchair generaling this. The Israelis say Hamas is down to about a quarter of its effective pre-war combat strength. Maybe a third, maybe there's a third of it left. And the units that remain have not been engaged. So it's not like the Israelis have been trying to kill these units, that there are parts of Gaza where some of Hamas's battalions remain embedded with the civilian population that have not yet been subjected to Israeli attack because of the presence of civilians. So there's a lot of negotiations right now uh, between, well, there had been at least between Israel and, and Washington about what to do. Because as the Israeli campaign has advanced, it has compressed the, the surviving civilian population into a tighter area. Right. So you have this. So quarter it's, to it's, two... it's, it's like the last quarter is much harder to get at than the first. The the population did. I mean, no. I mean, again, this is really, the Israelis could do it. The Israelis could end this fucking thing in an afternoon if they wanted to. But we, we always hear about how dense the Gazan civilian population is. It's denser than ever right now because right. most of the Gaza Strip has been evacuated. Right. So you've got this quarter, roughly, of Hamas remaining combat battalions with like triple or quadruple the already high level of population density around them. It's why the Israelis haven't gone in yet. They're trying to figure out how to do this without killing a million and a half people. Right. Interesting. And it sucks. But like this is, and again, I'm not, I'm not excusing anything here early 21st century Canadians, Americans, Westerners have had two examples in like the last two years of old school war again, Russia in Ukraine and Israel in Gaza. This is not, this is not a, like the, the Royal Canadian regiment backed by some helicopters fighting a few hundred Taliban insurgents anymore. This is mass warfare in populated areas in the West. We hadn't seen this shit in generations. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Like I, I've told people this before. I think I've told you this before. One of the reasons I was so goddamn bummed out after October 7th is because I knew what the Israeli response was going to look like. It wasn't going to be drone strikes and special forces. Right. Um, so like I, I, I like and subscribe. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the stuff that's interesting me in, in Israel right now, because again, it's, it's just more way up my alley is I'm, I'm getting very much down the rabbit hole around the red heifer and the sacrifice of the red heifer or heifer on the mountain, on Mount of Olives and the degree yeah. to which that will both provoke the local Muslim population because I don't know if you've been following this, but essentially there's a there's an ancient prophecy that suggested that when um, uh, the, uh, the Jews essentially sacrifice a perfect red heifer, this will become the forerunner of a process by which the third temple shall be re, will be re, reenact will be reconstituted, and that will happen on the site of the the second temple, which happens to be occupied at the moment um, by the Al Aqsa Mosque, and of course this suggests that the Al Aqsa Mosque would have to be destroyed in order to uh, put up the, the, the third temple, um, which would be just an enormous provocation and would potentially suggest that there's, there's a real all out war between Israel and its neighbors would be, would be probable, if not significantly probable. And in fact, this is one of the, one of the, re one of the reasons why Hamas attacked on October 7th is that they openly said, their leaders openly said that the red heifer, the transfer of five red cows from Texas to to Israel was seen as a provocation, and this this was one of the reasons why they attacked. So, I don't know I find this stuff interesting because I think we in the secular West absolutely underestimate the degree to which religious people mean what they say. Um, and even if you don't believe in these prophecies, and that's fine, you still have to understand what motivates people to act and behave in the way that they do. Um, there are Jewish religious fundamentalists who are and have been openly trying to advocate for the creation of a third temple. Oh, and they have friends in the American they've evangelical they've got friends movement. in the American evangelical community who believe that the creation of the third temple yeah. will, be, will bring about the second coming of Jesus. Um, this is, this is what's motivating them. Um, you know, we know that they've spent like half a million dollars. Like this is, this is not secret stuff. This has been openly discussed. There are, these groups have spent half a million dollars to move five perfect red cows to Israel, and we know that I believe that the altar in which one of these cows is going to be sacrificed has now been built 
on the Mount of Olives. Burn the cow, right? They're going to burn it on an altar. No, I think I think you've got to I think you've got to slit its wrists and then burn the carcass and then put the ashes of the, wa- the carcass into a water that then is used as a purification um, for a further sacrifice, yeah. which is blah 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 blah. I think I believe that's what it is. So Jen's said, done her reading. I well, but I find that. <laughs> That the religious aspect of it is what I find really you have interesting. A, you have an interest in that stuff, yeah. Oh, See, yeah. See, I'm absolutely. interested in bomb damage assessments. You're interested in the occult. True, correct. That is that is that is accurate. Um, but anyway, so uh, I, I find this stuff fascinating because I think that if if even if we we in the secular West be like, well, this is ridiculous. You're killing a cow. What's the cow done to you? It doesn't matter because if the people on the ground take the prophecy seriously, and if the people yeah. responding to it take the enacting of the prophecy as a as a as a provocation as they necessarily must um that could spin fighting and warfare into really really weird places that i'm not sure that we can necessarily predict so that's just stuff that i'm paying attention to and i find really interesting i have brought that up to people who are more informed on this stuff than i have and they said jen you're you're insane you're being crazy if a couple of religious fundamentalists kill a cow that's not that doesn't mean that they're going to blow up the Al-Aqsa mosque. Like, come on now, get a grip. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. That's fair. But like I said, I think that the, the failure that we in the West often run into is because we're secular and we don't yeah. actually really believe in God. We assume yeah. that everybody else really doesn't believe in yeah. God either. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that's it. Bingo. And what, I, think, like, I think that's... Put that on a t-shirt. It would be a weird T-shirt, but put it on a T-shirt, right? And I, I this is, and this is why we don't take religious fundamentalists at, their, at face value, um, and it's why we also, for example, when when uh, terrorists of all kinds of religious stripes say crazy ass things to explain yeah. their motives for why they're doing things, we don't take their their claims at face value. We assume, oh no, there must be some reasonable, rational reason why they're engaging in this stuff. They, they, they this this is about colonialism. This is about economics. This is about power. We, 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 we really struggle to consider that the religious motivation is the motivation because we can't take religious motivations seriously ourselves. And I think that is an absolutely fatal error that we in the secular West have. Oh, I, okay. Yes. Put it on a t-shirt, endorse fully. I will just add this. It's a mistake that is not limited to religion. I do think one of the problems we have, one of my friends told me just recently an, an interesting observation that he thinks the Overton window has gotten so narrow, we've forgotten it's there. And that there is a blind spot across a huge swath of our society, that there are people out there who disagree with them. And like what you're saying, I think, makes 100% sense in the context of religious fanaticism. For non-religious fanatics, religious fanatics seem weird. Mm-hmm. And when we, like, to me, you're talking about the red heifer and burning the thing. And I know the Hamas has talked about the red heifer as, as a provocation. Yes. And, and they don't necessarily see the red heifer as the prophecy that many of the Jewish fundamentalists do. They see but, it as a deliberate insult. But they do recognize yeah. that it is a provocation because it is the first sign that there are, that there is a committed group of people in Israeli society that wants to tear down what they consider to be the third most holiest place in Islam. All of this to me sounds and like you know, i live in toronto i have had this experience where i'm riding a bus and some guy sits down next to me and goes hey good morning and i go good morning and he goes i'm controlled by nanobots and planted in me by the cia and i okay, go mm-hmm. how's that working out i go you? yep okay and we, we have a little chat about that like talking about like extreme fringe religious dogma to me sounds like talking to cia nanobot uh, sure. nanobots guy but i accept that nanobots guy believes it Mm -hmm. And he is likely to behave accordingly. And I have to base my behavior around the fact that this guy thinks nanobots implanted him by the CAA are controlling his body. That's right. And when I hear people talking about we have to import from evangelicals in the southern United States perfect cows so that one of them can be ritually slaughtered to fulfill a religious prophecy, I go, oh, okay, yeah, mm mm-hmm. 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 but that doesn't mean i assume they won't do it <laughs> like i kind of a, i believe in taking people at face value right um so yeah i agree with you on on all of that stuff the, the, the only comment i would close with here because i you know more about the stuff than i do you kind of get the feeling over the last few years like i, I watch these videos of like those boston dynamics i think of like the r- robots that can do like incredible things 
and they can like jump and hold things or some of the AI technology we're really pushing on here. And I kind of had the sense of, oh, neat. Don't do that. <laughs> like, don't design robots that could easily kill a human being. Let's not design AI programs that can write malicious computer code. Let's not take perfect red heifers and slaughter them on a hill overlooking Jerusalem here. I just kind of feel like over the last five to 10 years we've had, we should probably stop trying to actively make things worse. That's do you want to, do you want like to stop tempting fate. That's kind of where I come down. Yeah, on this. I'm not particularly superstitious, but stop trying to build fucking Skynet and don't slaughter the cows. Yeah. Do you want to know what I, what I feel? I feel that there is a deep instinctual collective urge toward chaos. I think that we're pushing every button because we want to see it go boom. I, I, think, I, I think, would prefer I think there's, things I, not to go I, I boom. Think, I kind of got a good thing. No, going. no, I, I know, I get it, but I do think that there's something dark and innate to our nature as a as a as a species that craves self annihilation and drama. And I See, think when you talk about I this think... stuff, you start rubbing your temple like you've got like an evil villain quirk. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, but that's what I think we're leaning into. We toward. should unleash the hounds of war. I, I Thanks, don't. that's Jen Gerson of the I line part. I, 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 think, I think that we're essentially putting ourselves in a situation where we're where we're hurting ourselves for no good reason. Um, but I do recognize that there's, I don't know, a dark shadow force at work in the depths of our collective souls that feels that we've had things too comfortable and too good for too long. And we're just going to start, just start peeling away at it so, just to see what happens. And that's what I feel is is there something like that that's happening there's a force that's driving us towards self-annihilation in the pursuit of i don't know i almost want to quote dune here in pursuit of the golden path right you know like there's there's something like that going on we're just we're just we're all kind of like let's just dance on the edge of the volcano just because i want to see what it feels like okay you can go dance on the edge of the volcano i'm going to be at the full side not- bar I'm not endorsing dancing on the edge of the volcano. I just, I'm just seeing it. I'm seeing it happen. You have a skull in your office. Yeah, but that holds a nice plant. I agree with you. I just like human skulls. Okay, Pat. I nope. I think you know what? You do I like think... human skulls. It's deeply creepy, but your fundamental point. I agree, and I have known. I suspect. You have known, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest everyone who has stuck around in this podcast long enough to have made it to this point. Hello, we we salute you. We get to the good stuff at the end. We do. Everybody who is to play. listening right now, and we're we're down to our we're down to our top five <laughs> don't, don't right now. You. you are committed. All, um, we have all known people who self sabotage their life, and mm-hmm. we see them. And I'm just thinking of examples here. Someone who builds a successful business and then gambles it all away. Someone who meets a great romantic partner and then cheats on them. Mm -hmm. Um, People. Yeah. I do know people. Some of them I know well, some of them I love and I've talked to them about this and I've had to say to them, the reason this keeps happening to you is because you keep doing it. That's right. And there is like the first seven or eight times I could buy that. Oh, (laughs) tough luck. You know? Yeah. But no, at, at a certain point, when the exact, when your life echoes the same pattern over and over and over, that's your fault. And I do agree with you that there is something on the scale of human civilization that is self-destructive. And, you know, there's been books in the last few years, all talking about like, um, I can't remember, what's the the fourth turning? Oh, is that, that what the yeah, book? the fourth turning. I think I've got another one here. It's Ray Dalio's book, which I mean. The, and there was another I mean, one the, I read about that talking about sort of like of this. A lot of this stuff requires psycho- a certain kind of weird reading of history. I don't take all yeah. of it at face value. But, but the, the, the idea of a cyclical yeah. human history, if we accept it, and I'm not sold on this, but I'm intrigued by it. We are at the point of the cycle that is colloquially described as good times produce soft people. Soft people produce hard times. Hard times produce hard people. Hard people produce good times. So it's sort of this this cycle. Yeah. And I think if we accept the theory, we're at the shit part of that cycle right now, where a good run 
has set up the conditions of flakiness. And I don't say that in the future tense. I think we're in that right now. Like we were saying earlier, most of the problems we have are solvable, but we have somehow failed to solve them. So I don't know if it's going to be a robot that we thought it was like, you know, okay, years ago, my, I went to see Terminator 3. You do, you do 3. get the impression that we're all kind of trapped in, trapped in a, in a, in a momentum of history that we can't escape now, though. I can't yes. be the only one who has that feeling. Like, it doesn't matter how smart you and I personally are and how, how much we can correctly identify the issues, that, that we're all kind of locked into a, to a timeline now and we can't escape. That's a very metaphysical way of putting it or psychohistorical way of putting it. What I would say is we have probably baked in problems we no longer have the ability to avoid, and we're now into the management and mitigation phase. Yeah, that's but, a better way of saying it. So years ago, I went to see it seems, Terminator it seems 3 so with my buddies. sensible and rational when you say it. So I don't have How a skull behind How come I'm the lunatic? Because you're rubbing your face into the glee and you have skulls behind you. I don't. I want to tell you my Terminator 3 oh, anecdote. Sorry, right. Go, 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 go. So I went to see Terminator 3, and there's this great scene in it where the bad Terminator from the future infiltrates a military base and sort of corrupts the computer programming of a bunch of armed drones. And then the armed drones go crazy and they kill a bunch of people. And my friend and I were like watching the movie. And because our senses of humor are broken this way, we were like, who is the guy at the base who filed like the requisition report to be like, you know, I think we should have a lot of killer drones. <laughs> And the and the and the the, 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 the supply officer say, like, yeah, yeah, okay, like yeah, I'll, I'll sign off on those. Uh, where do you want to put them? It's like we should put them right next to the conference room. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, we'll put them in the conference room, and they should be loaded with munitions. Uh, normally, we, normally we'd put the munitions in the ammo locker. No, 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 no. We need to have the drones next to the conference room, and they have to have their machine guns loaded, and they have to have missiles. Uh, okay, but we should probably not have fuel in the tanks and we should not charge the batteries. Oh, no, 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 we, we have to put fuel in the tanks, we have to charge the batteries. So, like, it was just making fun of, like, a plot hole in the movie. It's like, why do you have, like, this sensitive military command site and a bunch of armed drones with loaded with, like, fuel and charged batteries and bullets and missiles that are, like, two doors down the hall? With hindsight, maybe the base should not have stored the corruptible killer armed drone systems right down from the NORAD command center. But it, like I used to laugh at that as like a plot hole in a mediocre movie. Now I actually think it's a pretty accurate commentary on hu humanity. Yes, basically we're all living a, a, a terrible comedic plot hole of a timeline. Um, I also want to just, uh, before we end this podcast, say, Matt, I really hope you enjoy the solar eclipse that's coming. Unrelated to the sense of pending doom and self-annihilating prophecy that um, I was talking yeah. about forward. Really hope you enjoy that solar eclipse. I'll be um, listening to a Red Heifer podcast as the moon obscures the sun and perfect. blots it out in the sky above and the sky turns red. You know, you joke now. Just wait until we come back to this conversation next week. If we do. <laughs> On that note, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank an amazing you. weekend if you can. If you can. It may be your last one.